Hello, everyone, and welcome to ACP's live remote non-CE offering. My name is Dan Cabell, and I will assist in moderating today's non-CE course. Today's non-CE topic is rehab strategies for patients with dementia, fall prevention focus, and will last approximately 45 minutes. I would like now to introduce Jacqueline Oltmans, who will be our presenter today. Jacqueline is a DPT and works as a clinical program consultant with ACP. Jacqueline, it's all yours. What we're going to talk about today um, is, you know, one of what I would consider probably the hardest um, type of patient to treat, and, and, it, and it is those with, um, with suffering from dementia or any cognitive um, decline. So one of the things I like to start out with um, is how do you approach a patient so that your interaction with your patient is a positive one, okay? A number of times we often, whether we're approaching the patient from behind, um, you know, we've gotten a little bit more casual in the way that we introduce ourselves um, to others. So, you know, we don't necessarily shake hands as much as we used to. And obviously right now we're really not shaking hands at all. Um, but whether you come up from behind someone, put your hand on their shoulder and say, you know, hey, Mrs. Jones, how are you? Um, patients with dementia, because of the visual changes um, that are occurring, um, you know, you can frighten them very, very easy. So one thing that we, we truly want to do is talk about more of a supportive um, approach or a supportive stance versus what we would consider a confrontational stance, right? A confrontational stance is you standing right in front of somebody in a fairly um, close position, okay? Um, and, and a lot of it is because of their visual changes. So, um, I, I, and I can't see any of you, but I'm just gonna, you know, um, trust that you all may or may not be doing this with me. Um, but one thing I want you guys to do, um, if you have space is right, if you put your arms out straight to the side, and if I'm looking um, straight forward, I, as far as my peripheral vision, right, I can't really see my hands, my fingers wiggling. So for me, I got to bring my arms in just a bit in order for me to see my fingers, my fingers wiggling. So what that is showing me, right, is that I'm losing a little bit of my peripheral vision. Um, and as we age, we do, we lose some of our peripheral vision. So patients with um, dementia at the age of about 75, we tend to lose about 30 degrees of our peripheral vision. Um, and then if you add, you know, early to mid stages of dementia, you lose another 15. So their visual field is going to be a lot smaller um, than, than you or I, okay, or somebody that maybe doesn't have dementia. So what we really want to consider is approaching a patient from the front. So even if you're coming up from behind them, I want you to walk past them and come right in front of them, okay, right in front of them. Um, they're going to be able to see more of you, and I want you to be at least two arm, width, arm lengths away, okay? If you are too close to them, that is, again, what we would consider more um, of a confrontational approach or a confrontational stance. You want them to feel safe and to see all of you. Okay, once you've approached them from the front at least two arm lengths away, then you're going to give them a visual, okay? I'm not going to wave my hand. I'm just going to give them a visual, right? We as humans prefer to receive um, data visually, okay, then verbal or auditory, right? So if you hear a loud noise, the first thing you're going to do is turn to look at it. I feel much more comfortable if I can see it um, versus maybe just hearing what is going on, okay? Then um, the third way is going to be touch, okay, or our sense of touch, then we've got our sense of smell and our sense of taste. Okay, those are the kind of the five big ways that we as humans take in data. And again, the number one way is going to be visually. Okay, so if you approach a patient, you give them that visual cue, right, which is hopefully going to um, direct their attention onto your hand. Now, one of the best things about giving them this visual is if you do it on the right, and you have your name tag on, right? It's gonna direct them to your hand, um, which is very close to your name tag. Okay, I always recommend wearing your name tag on the upper right shoulder, okay? Um, again, you do that because most patients, whether they're left-handed or right-handed, are gonna shake with their right hand, um, and then they can follow your hand and actually see your name tag. 
Okay, so we've given them a visual, then you're going to give them a verbal, right? Hi, my name is Jacqueline, and you're going to reach out your hand to shake their hand. Okay, when you shake a patient's hand, um, that, that, you know, a patient that potentially has dementia, a couple things could actually go wrong. One of them is you go to shake and, you know, they might grip you a little too hard, in which case, if you're not used to working with patients with dementia, right, the brain, the cortisol in your brain increases um, and you actually get a little bit stressed, right, um, and you try and maybe pull away if they're holding on too tight. The other um, thing that could happen is that um, you could actually grip their hand a little too tight and actually scare them. So instead of going into a handshake, we're going to go into what we call hand under hand, and I'm going to um, describe that on the next slide. Okay, so kind of in review, you're going to approach your patient from two arm lengths away. You're going to raise that hand and you're going to say, hi, my name is Jacqueline. How are you? And then you're going to reach out your hand. Okay. All you're trying to do with this initial approach, right, is truly build a rapport and a connection with the patient. Patients love to hear compliments and they love to have a purpose. So if we think about our patients with dementia at this point in their life, particularly those living in a skilled nursing facility, right, um, we're doing a lot for them, right? We, we, we have, we are considered um, our, our caretakers, right? We're doing a lot for them. Um, and sometimes it can almost be too much where they don't even feel like they have a purpose, okay? When we go into our hand under hand on this next slide, you guys, you're going to see um, why we consider ourselves care partners and not necessarily caretakers, okay? So we've kind of gone through the approach, right? We've given our, our visual and then our verbal, hi, my name is Jacqueline, you're going to reach out, and then we're going to go into what we call a hand under hand. So this technique um, was created by an occupational therapist by the name of Tipa Snow. Most of you maybe have heard of her. She is truly world renowned um, when it comes to uh, her work with patients and dementia. Um, I first went to one of her courses and I was really blown away at how applicable all of her techniques um, were in skilled care. And I had been at that time, I had been, you know, working for ACP for about five years and I had never heard of her and I was blown away. Um, so then I started taking more of her courses and, and getting, becoming a little bit more certified um, in some of, uh, in some of her courses. Um, and this is one of her techniques that truly allows us to become um, care partners instead of caretakers. Now, what do I mean by care partner versus caretaker, right? You want to partner with your patient so that they can do the most that they're able to do even until the very end of their life um, and, and not do absolutely everything for them. Okay, so when you do your hand under hand, you really want to do it more on the dominant side. Um, so, you know, I'm right handed. Um, so if somebody were going to do it on me, they would do it on my right side. Um, lock up and lock and rock up. So when you go in to meet your patient, you're going to actually um, uh, kind of put thumbs, thumbs together and you're going to create this butterfly and then your hand goes on bottom and your pointer and your middle finger should end up truly in the web space of your person's thumb, okay? Um, <clears throat> again, I'll demonstrate this in a video at the um, end of the presentation, uh, but it, it is truly a way to build a connection um, and then you're able to kind of lead your patient wherever you want to lead them because you've got their hand, wherever their hand's gonna go, um, their body's going to follow, right? What do you do with that other hand, right? So the other hand can place, if you're standing next to your patient, you've got your hand under hand, your other hand can go, you know, if they have a gate belt on, on the opposite hip on the gate belt um, or at a joint. But the last place that you want to put that hand is at a muscle belly, belly right? We don't want to um, stimulate those muscle spindles. So we want to either at a joint or maybe on either hip. Um, when you're leading a patient using hand under hand, I don't recommend you put your hand on their back. 
um, just because sometimes it can feel like you're forcing them um, forward and we don't re really want them to feel like we're pushing them. Um, so you can lead your patient. You can also use this technique um, to help a patient eat, to unbutton their shirt. Um, you will see in the video, hopefully, um, that when their hand is on top of yours, you still have um, your skill fingers. So you can still hold a fork if you needed to. You could still hold a comb or a brush, right, if you were going to help them brush their hair. Okay, um, the importance of your pointer and your or, or your middle finger falling kind of right in the web space of their thumb um, is there, there's actually an acupoint there, LI4. Um, if your patient is kind of, um, if you need to kind of redirect them, you can pulse that web space of their thumb and it actually redirects their attention to you. So we use that in the case of, you know, if we're taking a patient, um, if we're trying to toilet a patient, a lot of times if they see that toilet, they'll end up just going. And so what we do is we can kind of pulse that um, acupoint and keep their attention on us until we get them right in front of the toilet. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, move on from this and we're gonna cross our fingers that our videos are gonna work at the end of the, at the end of the hour, all right? Fall prevention. So, you know, as a CPC for ACP, we start a number of programs, one of them being fall prevention programs. One of the first things I do is ask, okay, do you have a log of your recent falls, whether it's within the last month or maybe the last quarter, right? A lot of facilities will keep, where did the patient fall? What shift, you know, what maybe happened? Um, so I like to look at those. Um, a number of them will say, you know, um, the reason they fell cognitively impaired would not push their call light. Okay. Um, and then the intervention for that will a lot of times say, you know, reminded the patient to push their call light. So this is something um, that we're asking our patient to do something that they truly don't have the ability to do. Right? They're never going to push their call light, so why do we keep putting it in front of them? We need to come up with something else. Um, I always compare this to a toddler okay, or you know, a, a six-month, one-year-old. When I started doing all of this dementia um, education, my, my uh, five-year-old was about 18 months at the time, um, and, and now I have an almost one-year-old, so she's going to take over in, in my examples. Um, but what do we do with our toddlers to ensure their safety, right? Well, we increase our supervision, okay? And then we might do things to keep them occupied. So I'll sit my almost one-year-old um, on the floor with her toys, or I might put some um, lullabies on the TV so that I can go, you know, make dinner for my older girls, right? So I increase my supervision, right? The younger our children are, the more they need supervised. Um, and then I really truly keep her occupied so that it frees me up to do some other things. It is very, very similar to patients with dementia, okay? <clears throat> they go through five degrees of emotions and boredom is very, very, very common, okay? Are they bored? Are they lonely? Are they scared? Are they sad or are they angry? Okay, these are all things that will... Um, cause a patient to maybe get out of their wheelchair or get out of their chair because they need something. There is a need that is not being met, okay? So keeping them occupied, um, how, how do we do this? Well, the, the number one recommendation that I can give you is to know as much about your patient um, as possible, okay? What do I mean by that, right? What, were, what was their career? What were their hobbies? How many kids did they have? What kind of music do they like? Were they religious? You know, do they pray? Um, and then you utilize all of this to really keep them safe um, and to create a rapport and get, get your agenda accomplished, right? Without them really knowing what it is. So there are some examples on here, you guys, right? If your patient um, was a homemaker, you know, can they fold clothes? Can they match socks? These are some things that they can do in a seated position, right? If we're concerned about safety. Um, were they a Mr. or Mrs. Fix-It, right? So PVC pipe is a really, really common one um, that we do. So a really good example of this, um, I, I, I love, you know, applicable examples, but 
Um, we had a facility uh, a few months back and I was actually getting ready to do a presentation on dementia. And one of the CNAs that came into my course had a bandage on her arm and she was not very happy. I could tell something had happened. Well, she was working the night shift and um, one of their patients on the memory unit actually uh, bit her. Okay, so, and then after this incident, she's coming in and, and listening to this presentation on how to manage patients with dementia. So, um, you know, we talked it out. What had happened is this gentleman got up at midnight and he wanders. Um, and how many activities do we truly have for patients at midnight, right? Not a lot. So he got up, he was going into other patients' rooms. Um, he went into a patient's rooms, all the CNAs ran in there. And they vigorously tried to remove him and he got mad. He probably got scared and, and he bit one of them. Okay. So uh, moving forward, they have set up um, in a room, they had set up some PVC pipe. So we talked about how do you approach him when he's wandering? How do we go into hand under hand and lead him maybe into a room where there's actually some activities for him to do? Okay, so that's a really good example of how if we can keep our patients occupied, um, you know, we can hopefully see less, you know, wanting to um, exit seek um, and, and just less issues in general. Okay, so if you have a, an, a car lover, right, get pictures of old cars, um, you know, uh, any of the little toy old uh, cars, um, puzzles with cars on them, right? So something that truly keeps their attention that they are or were interested in, right? If you have a businessman or woman, um, sometimes keeping files um, and having them file folders in their room, again, things that they can do in a seated position. Um, if you have a musician making different playlists, um, and we've all seen, um, you know, patients that will carry a baby doll around. It gives them a purpose, right? When um, a lot of times they don't feel like they truly have a purpose anymore. Alarms. So <clears throat> research, you know, shows that alarms don't necessarily decrease our falls. By the time, you know, we actually get to them, the patient has truly already fallen. Um, and they can be very alarming to patients with dementia. If you think back when you were young, right, what was the first alarm that um, we ever were kind of taught about? Right. I remember it was in elementary school and it was the fire alarm. Right. What do you do when you hear the fire alarm? Well, you get up, you get out of your seat and you rush to the fire exit. Right. Or whatever plan you had in place. So think about that. Um, it actually can increase a patient's fight or flight response, um, which is definitely something we don't want. OK. Medications. Um, orthostatic hypotension is obviously very common. A lot of times medications get initiated and never reassess. We want to make sure that we are reassessing um, our patients' medications and taking them off the ones that they don't need or aren't working. Um, TIPA Snow, a lot of times we'll say a third of the medications help patients with dementia, a third don't really change, and a third actually make them worse. Um, so little did I know five years ago when I started um, doing all of this uh, education on dementia um, that my, my dad would would shortly be diagnosed with, um, you know, it was the neurologist thinks it's either Lewy body dementia, which presents a lot like Parkinson's, or it could be Parkinson's. So with him, we have been going kind of on a wild goose chase to find a medication that will help him. Um, so we've taken him off some, reinitiated some, one actually seemed to be working and now we've kind of regressed a little bit. Um, so uh, unfortunately the medications, they're, they're, they're not gonna do anything for the actual, you know, um, deteriorating of the brain. What they do is they treat the symptoms, right? So they're gonna treat the hallucinations potentially or the delusions. Um, but at the same time, right, they, uh, in, in my dad's case, they actually make him very, very, very tired. Um, so a lot of times, you know, families would rather see their loved one maybe a little bit more on the sedated side than having an emotional kind of outbreak. So if we can learn to manage those patients so they don't have those an emotional episodes, um, rather than keeping them sedated, their overall quality of life is so much better. Okay. Um, the visual deficits, again, um, you know, looking at the patient's room, if you put something right next to them, a lot of times they're not going to see it because of the peripheral vision that has been lost. 
Um, another way to kind of look at it is patients with um, in early stages of dementia have what we call scuba mask. So um, if, if, if you all want to do this and kind of, you know, uh, see what they're experiencing, right? So this is kind of what we would consider early stages. Our mid stages is what we call binocular vision. Okay, so now you've really lost a lot of your peripheral vision. And then once we get into late stages of dementia, we, we call this monocular vision. So if you cover up one eye, right, um, now you've really, really lost a lot of that depth perception. Um, so you want to kind of modify the room based on that, on that visual loss. Um, you know, give them more space than you think they need to go around something. Um, because a lot of times they're just not... Um, because of that peripheral vision that they've lost, it's, it's, it really becomes a safety issue. Exercise. So we all know that exercise um, is positive for patients to help decrease their risk for falling. Okay. Um, a, a, another kind of one of my best recommendations is when you're treating patients with dementia, I want you to forget about if you are a PT or an OT, Right, I want you to forget about how you generally and traditionally have exercised with patients um, because it needs to be meaningful for these patients. Um, I mean, I think about even myself, if I'm sitting um, in a basement on a treadmill, my workouts go, much, they seem to go so much longer than if I'm out running by a lake, okay? The more you enjoy it, right? The more, um, the, the more meaningful it will be. So patients with dementia, right? Tend to really enjoy, um, dancing and it's because they can still understand rhythm. Um, <clears throat> men like to exercise either alone or with a woman and women prefer, um, a buddy to exercise with, right? Generally speaking, 15 to 20 minutes a day or a hundred minutes per week. And we want to kind of get them into that 70% of their heart rate reserve based off that Carbonin formula, um, or increase shortness of breath, but are still able to talk. Um, there is another kind of exercise concept out there. It's called love to move. You can just go online and Google love to move you guys. And I actually downloaded, um, one of their, their booklets. Um, but a lot of it is, a lot of it is um, bilateral asymmetrical movements. Okay, so for example, this is one of them. Sorry, I know um, I'm not quite as large on your screen, but if you can see my hands. So bilateral asymmetrical movements this is probably one of the easier ones. Um, another one is you know using one hand to grab your nose, the other hand to grab your ear, and then switching that, okay? So it's, um, it's, bilateral asymmetrical movements. Probably the hardest one that um, I have, I've looked at is taking one hand and going up and down, and then your other arm is doing a triangle. Okay. So again, asymmetrical um, bilateral movement, and then you switch. So if you guys want to try that, take your pointer fingers and with one arm, try and just go up and down. And with your other arm, try and do a triangle, right? And it is at the same time. Okay. Um, it almost kind of makes your, your brain hurt when you're done. And then you switch sides. So I'm going to go up and down with this one. And I'll do a triangle with this one. Anyway, um, it's a really cool technique um, and it, it really truly does challenge the brain. Um, and then dual tasking, right? So if you're throwing a ball back and forth to work on um, to work on balance, right? I would say a, a good example is start at the beginning of the alphabet, right? And we're going to talk about fruits. So every time you throw a ball back and forth, you're thinking A, okay, apple. The next person goes banana, um, C, coconut, right? So um, not only are you doing a functional task, but also, also a um, cognitive task as well. Um, and then music therapy, right? So increasing our fluidity of movement um, and make it relatable to the patient. So music therapy for patients that have dementia, um, because their right temporal lobe um, tends to not be as affected as much, they can still um, have that ability to understand rhythm. Okay, and music. So it really does help to increase the fluidity of their movement 
um, and can also help increase um, uh, their mood, right? So they're kind of in a, in a better mood. One of my, you know, what we do with my dad is he has a record player. And so um, every time I'm over there, I'll grab an old record. And I mean, he's got everything dating back to the 1950s um, and we'll play some old records. And I can see an instant change in his um, mood and personality just by playing some of his old music. Um, so make it relatable to the patient, right? You don't want to play um, a music they're not familiar with. You want it to be kind of um, from their generation. And usually it's music that they listen to in their late teens to their late 20s. All right. Um, <clears throat> as far as exercise goes, right, we know um, th that it helps. Um, it actually helps increase our BDNF or brain derived neurotropic factor, um, which helps with the synapses um, and uh, in the brain and with our overall nerve axon health. Okay, it can become a, a mood stimulator, it can help decrease agitation um, from patients. Um, and then overall, just improve our physical function, right? Decreasing our fall risk, um, which, you know, We've, we've got our ACP fall pathway um, that you can you know, check with your CPC um, if that's something you feel like needs to be initiated at your facility. Forms of exercise, right, include aerobic strength training and balance training. How can you guys do aerobic training, right, in a way that is fun for the patient? How can you do strength training then in a way that is fun for the patient? Like I said, forget all of your traditional strength training or balance training, right? You've got to add something so that it is meaningful and fun for the patient. Um, particularly, let's say a patient was a homemaker, right? Can you have them maybe hang clothes up as far as balance exercises, right? So that they don't really know that they're exercising. Um, we had one facility where the therapist was trying to gait train a patient and the patient would just sit down. The patient did not want to do anything. Um, their family came and we said, you know what, why don't we give your family a tour of the facility? This was obviously pre-COVID. Um, and you know what, there will be a post-COVID um, and, and hopefully we can get back to normal. Um, so keeping some of that in mind. Um, errorless learning ensures that a, um, a correct response every time from the patient. So making it easy enough so they don't get frustrated and they're actually successful increases the endorphins, right? Increases their mood. Um, and then a home exercise program, if possible, um, you know, again, make it familiar, make it fun for them um, if that's something that your patient can do, okay? Environmental modifications, keeping it calm and comfortable. Um, you know, this is something that is such a challenge for us right now um, because we come into our patients' rooms and we've got masks on, maybe a face shield. Um, you know, that is not calming and comfortable for our patients. Um, so, you know, again, there will be a post-COVID. <laughs> um, I have seen, you know, in, in the dementia world, we have seen some therapists take pictures of their faces and kind of tape it to the front of them so that the patient knows who's coming in. Um, some facilities, you know, uh, clear masks was, was one option. Um, you know, anything you can do to make your patient feel more comfortable. When it comes to their five senses, right? Um, so visually, auditory, touching, taste, and smell. How do we create an environment um, that is soothing for the patient, right? Um, you know, natural light is usually um, soothing, is again, playing some of their favorite music. Some will do um, different smells. Lavender seems to be a really popular one. Um, I sometimes, you know, you can get your patients to, to do more if you offer them a cup of coffee, right? So think about those five senses um, and, 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 and what does your patient, you know, love according to those five senses and, and what do they not like according to those five senses? And those are the ones you're going to want to stay away from, right? Um, create a meaningful and familiar environment, right? So family photos, um, family photos might be from 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, if they're recent family photos, you know, they, they may not recognize the people in them. Um, favorite colors, any familiar books. 
Um, blankets, patients in dementia in their journey get very tactile um, at times. So uh, we had one patient in a facility that kept going um, into another patient's room and stealing her nice big blanket. Um, so we uh, ended up getting her one very, very similar to that um, so that she wouldn't steal her <laughs> roommates anymore. Um, stuffed animals, and then again, baby dolls, things that make them uh, feel, feel comfortable. Okay, um, keeping a structured environment. So sometimes if a patient is able to assist in filling out a visible schedule, um, you know, if they have some say in it, it, it again, it, it gives them a purpose, it gives them some, um, some decisions to make. Um, and if, you know, if they have the ability, keeping a notebook or a diary of their daily thoughts. And then obviously keeping their environment safe, right? So what are some of those risk factors, right? Loose rugs, dim lights, clutter, um, their call bell, right? Making sure it's, it's in a place, um, you know, where they can see it. Um, and then having trained employees that, you know, have been educated on patients with dementia. Um, I, you know, I feel like anybody working in a memory care unit should have additional training and it should be more than just online training because I don't think we learn as much about that that way. So, you know, I, I prefer the hands-on stuff um, and we will eventually get back to that, hopefully. <laughs> All right. Um, and then making it uh, functional. So, you know, placement of everyday objects, again, taking into account their visual loss. Um, keeping clocks and calendars um, in and, and large enough so that they can see them and maybe color coding some of their activities. Um, it, it's kind of easier for them to understand, right, that maybe orange means it's activity time, maybe green means it's lunchtime, okay, um, and, and color coding some of that for so it's easier for them to understand. Um, you know, one thing that we also recommend our kind of activity boxes. So this is a really good idea, you guys. If, um, and there's a number of different activity boxes out there for every kind of patient, um, whether it's, you know, um, a nail care activity kit, um, again, a PVC pipe activity kit. Um, you know, again, if your patient's really tactile, we've gotten little um, pieces of cloth and um, cut them to just squares. And we've gotten, you know, um, all different kinds, cotton, silk, shiny fabric in different colors. And the patients will, you know, kind of um, organize them into different colors. So that's an option. There's, I mean, there's the, the, the opportunities are endless when it comes to that. So what the facility did, this specific facility actually had people donate objects. So for the nail kit, right, if you have any extra nail polish, um, you know, could you bring it in? We're going to put it all in a kit. Um, so they did a different kit, you know, every week or every month or whatever, and had the whole facility donate stuff. So, and then they created these activity kits um, for patients. So for the, for the billing aspect, um, I would say, could you delegate it to somebody or can you do it? Yes. In front of the patient or even have the patient, um, you know, participate with you, which is another great idea. Or could you have the patient doing something else while you're working on that? And a really great one um, would be, you know, if you're doing any biophysical agents, which leads us perfectly into our next slide, right? Could you be doing some of that stuff while your patient is maybe on e or on diathermy, okay? <clears throat> so when we talk about biophysical agents, you guys, with patients with dementia, um, it is, it's, it's a hot topic, right? I feel like therapists are very apprehensive to want to try e with a patient with dementia. Um, but I will tell you from experience, um, there are some patients who don't have dementia who don't like ESTIM, and there are patients with dementia who love ESTIM. It really is so very dependent on the patient. But we've got some ideas or some strategies that can kind of help if you truly think, you know, if you truly want to do ESTIM with your patient. Um, because we know, right, utilizing ESTIM in conjunction with an aerobic or a strength training program will get your patient that much more stronger if you are able to integrate ESTIM. Okay. When you've got some, um, you know, there's some different situations affecting different behaviors. Obviously, if your patient, 
you know, is having a, a behavioral episode, it might not be the best time to initiate an e-stim um, treatment. But, you know, there are some, there are some things that, that you can do. Um, when it comes to those challenging behaviors, you know, looking at the emotional status, are they lonely, scared, bored, angry, or sad? Those are kind of the big five, you guys. Um, can you move to a different um, or are they in an unfamiliar environment? So is there, um, you know, a place where they would feel more comfortable? Maybe your patient doesn't want to have Easton uh, down in the rehab department. Maybe they'd rather do it in their room. Um, are there any changes in caregiver arrangements that might be causing the patient um, to have some, you know, some behavioral outbreaks? Um, are they having any misperceived threats? Um, so again, if there's maybe a person that they're not familiar with, they, they might feel threatened. Okay, being asked to engage in a new task or one that is too difficult. Um, this kind of goes back to when you are, you know, asking your patient um, something you kind of want to stay away from yes or no um, questions, right? So, you know, if you ask your patient, do you mind if I try this electrical stimulation treatment with them? 70% of the time, they're going to say no, right? Because they don't know what it is. It's unfamiliar to them. Um, and so they're automatically just going to say no, right? So we give, we're going to give them an option. Instead of using um, yes or no, we want to give them options, Okay, are there any drug side effects that could be um, causing, you know, um, some different behaviors? Um, and then are there any discomforts in relation to our five senses, right? Sometimes if, um, you know, if they're clo too close proximity to somebody, um, if there's a noise outside that is bothering them, right? Maybe somebody's jackhammering outside. If there's a funny smell, you know, things like that. Um, you want to just kind of take a look at um, as far as those behaviors go. Okay. When we look at non-drug treatments, right, we want to, you know, non-drug approaches to help managing some of their behaviors can help pr promote physical and emotional comfort. Okay. Recognizing that the patient is not just acting mean or ornery, but maybe just having further symptoms of, of the disease. Um, we really need to, and I have another training that we talk about that goes into how, to, how the brain is changing. I feel like, um, and I even do it with families, right? If they know how the brain is changing, it um, allows them to accept it a little bit more um, and realize that the patient isn't, you know, truly meaning to be ang angry or say mean things, um, but that it is an effect of the disease, Okay. Um, identifying the cause and how the symptom may relate to the experience of the person with dementia, that behavior, and then changing the environment or helping to resolve some of those challenges um, to make it a little bit more, more comfortable for your patient. Okay, avoid being confrontational, um, redirect the patient's attention. Um, we always want to try and redirect. Um, I know sometimes it is challenging. Um, but, you know, can we redirect the patient's attention onto something else? Again, creating that calm environment, allowing your patient to get adequate rest, acknowledging requests and respond to them. Okay. All too often I've walked into facilities and I've seen patients sitting in their wheelchair yelling for help and a number of people walk by them and chalk it up to, oh, Mrs. Jones, she just kind of does that. But there might be truly an unmet need. Okay. And as a healthcare practitioner, right, don't take the behavior personally. Okay. So one, a really great option is to have your patient doing something during a biophysical agent treatment, right? So if you're going to be putting your patient on e-stim, I have a niece that we actually gets e-stim and what we have done with her, she's now four. What we have done with her is we give her her electrodes and we let her color on them so she can get used to them. And your patients could do the same thing, right? They could decorate them if they like to do arts and crafts. Um, they could decorate their electrodes. Um, and then, you know, kind of feels a little bit uh, more like theirs. And then Put, put them on. Okay. I usually recommend when you're doing e -STEM, you know, you put your electrodes on day one um, and maybe don't even turn the e -STEM unit up. Okay. Just let them get used to the electrodes. Then the next treatment, maybe you could increase your intensity so they start to feel a little tingle. And then maybe your third treatment, right? You are um, turning it up till you actually get either to that sensory or motor um, stimulation. 
Okay, so kind of easing them into it. And then while they're on, you know, could they be doing some arts and crafts? Could they be looking at books or magazines, right? Playing music or singing songs? Could they be working on puzzles, right? So lots of different activities that we want to have our patient doing while they're on it. Maybe that they would um, forget about that tingling sensation if they're not um, too fond of it. Okay, ESIM is often disregarded um, in favor of less invasive applications when it may actually be more effective. Okay, it is tolerated by most patients at a number of the different stages of dementia. As long as it is clinically applica applicable, I highly recommend at least trying it. Okay, communicating visually with your patient what you are doing, right? So you may even want to take your electrodes, put them on yourself first. Okay, show them what you're going to be doing before you put it on them. Okay, then you might be able to put it on them. Observing facial expressions, right, to help determine if the patient actually feels the output. Submotor tingle or just a sensory tingle for the first, again, the first couple of treatments, maybe the first week, um, and allowing that patient to accommodate to the stimulation. And then we're going to increase our output as tolerated and clinically appropriate for the patient. Okay, if the patient tends to remove them, um, you know, they may not be doing that because they don't like it. They may be doing that just out of interest. I would try again. If you don't feel like trying again that same day, maybe the next day, okay? But unless they seem aggravated, it might just be um, curiosity and not necessarily aggravation. So I would um, recommend trying again. Once you get the e-stim on, um, out of sight, out of mind is kind of um, helpful. So if you can cover your electrodes and your lead wires with a blanket and then having your patient do something else while they're on is helpful. When we're looking at safety, right, sometimes um, if our patients can't necessarily tell us what they're feeling or maybe the intensity, this slide goes into if you're utilizing a lower frequency waveform, right, our recommendations for your maximum intensity not to exceed um, when you're using either a two by two, two by four, or three by five electrode, um, even the smaller 1.4 by two. Um, sizes of electrodes. So whether you're using a lower frequency, right, your pens, your tens, um, or a higher frequency waveform like your MFAC or Russian stim, right, interferential for pain or nerve block, this slide is your maximum intensity depending on which size electrode you are using. I always, you know, for my facilities, I usually have them um, laminate this table and stick it somewhere on their cart or close to their units. And then we look at diathermy. Diathermy is a great option, uh, mostly because the patient doesn't really feel much. The challenge you have is, will your patient move too far away from the diathermy head? Okay, so um, again, having them do something, um, you know, while they're sitting there is a great option um, while you have the diathermy unit on them. Um, obviously, if your patient does not have the ability to tell you if it's too hot, whether you're using diathermy, a hot pack, or a thermal ultrasound, right, it is contraindicated for a thermal modality if your patient can't tell you if it's too hot, okay? But great options. So ultrasound, you know, same thing. Visually, show your patient what you're going to be doing. The reason, you know, we say visually is one, because that's how we prefer, again, to take in data. And number two, they don't always understand your auditory input, right? So I could be telling them something and they could be agreeing with me because they're nice. Um, but then when I go to do that, go to do that, then they're not, they, they don't want me to touch them. Okay. So making sure that you visually show them first um, what you're going to be doing. So if you're doing ultrasound, right, putting maybe the gel on yourself and showing them what the ultrasound is, and then, you know, hopefully they will let you do it on them, okay? And again, contraindicated for a thermal ultrasound if patients um, are unable to tell you if it's too hot. We're going to try this video. I've got 10 minutes, so we're going to try these videos, and I'm just going to really cross my fingers that they're going to work for you, all right? Hi, Don. Hi. My name is Jacqueline. How are you? Hi. Good. I liked your hair today. <laughs> Don, you and I, we're going to go over there. Okay? 
I'm going to pause it there. So you guys, that was kind of an example of the approach, right? You saw my visual, then my verbal, and then I reached out. I went into hand under hand. I'm going to show you an up close video of the hand under hand next, but I, I'm going to play this again. And I want you to um, make note of the compliment that I gave him, right? So this is my dad. He um, was a barber for I don't know, 60 years. And so I purposely chose to compliment his hair because I knew that it would mean something to him. And we kind of got a giggle out of, out of it because of that. So again, knowing about your patient is, is, is truly important. So I'm going to, I'm going to replay this and then you can kind of see how I'm leading him with that hand under hand position. Hi, Don. My name is Jacqueline. How are you? Good. I liked your hair today. <laughs> Done. You and I, we're going to go over there. Okay. Okay. He's pretty good with understanding um, what I'm saying, but let me tell you, using just those visual cues to point makes it so much more clear for him. And I mean, even though he can, you know, he understands what I'm saying, but it's just, it's, it's, it's so much easier for them if you guys are using some sort of visual cue. And it's just not normal for us, right? We don't talk like that every day. So you almost got to do a little game of charades. Okay, our next one, um, this is an actual hand under hand. Okay, so you can see, I'm going to rewind it, um, and I want you to kind of see here. If his hand was open, you guys would see kind of butterfly wings. Um, and then my hand goes underneath and sits on top. Okay, now in this position, right, I don't even need to close my fingers if, if it's uncomfortable for him. That's the best part about it is that he is literally just resting his hand on top of mine. Um, and I don't even have to grip him. And then again, you can see how easy it is to lead. Um, and if I don't grip my hand, I've got, you know, my skill fingers, my, you know, digits one through three are really considered more of our skill and four and five are more of our strength fingers. Um, so I can use those fingers to um, help, you know, comb his hair, brush his teeth. And the whole idea behind that is you guys, right? It's a closed loop. So for years and years and years, right? It, especially if you're helping somebody eat for years, if when they brought that spoon up to their mouth, their mouth opened, right? If somebody else is doing it for them, it doesn't make sense. But oh, guess what? If I'm doing it, it makes a lot of sense, okay? The other thing it's so helpful for is, you know, undressing patients or changing patients or toileting patients and helping them right? Take their pants down. It's very uncomfortable for them that maybe if somebody else is doing it, but guess what? If they feel like they're doing it, um, it's not as scary. Okay. Thank you so much, John. Certainly. Thank you for, to you and thank you for everyone that joined us. Well, with that, this will bring our webinar to a close and we look forward to seeing you in upcoming webinars. Be well, everyone. Thank you.